Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and let's praise God. Let's praise the Lord for what he is causing to happen in our lives. Come on and exalt our God this morning. I know that you've got it in you. I don't know about you guys, but I started off this morning casting my cares on the Lord. I started off this morning being covered in prayer. I started off this morning commanding my soul to rejoice. I started off this morning commanding my soul to worship that a weight, a, a heaviness was trying to come over me this morning, but I said not so. I began to declare those things that I know to be true. I began to steep myself in the reality of God. I began to encourage myself as the scriptures tell us to do. And I don't know about you guys, but anytime that I lean on the word of God, any time that I rest in his truth, any time that I choose to put all of my eggs in God's basket, God responds. And I believe this morning that God is responding to your faith, that God is responding to your hope. God is responding to your belief. God is responding to your trust. God is responding to your cares. God is responding responding he is responding he is responding that whatever anxieties you have, whatever concerns, fears, and worries that you have, when you cast them on him, he is faithful to respond by taking them. He is faithful to respond by causing there to be a transfer or rather an exchange in the spirit realm that he exchanges your cares for his peace. He exchanges your heaviness for his joy. He exchanges the lies of the enemy for more truth for his truth, for his word. And we just bless God today. We bless him, we bless him, we bless him this morning that we can rest in his truth, that we can steep ourselves in his truth, that we stand on his truth, we stand on his word, that we stand on his promises that over these last few days of August that we are resting into the miracles of God and we are standing firm in it, that we are resting, my God, Rebande, into the miracles of God, that we won't strive, strain, or toil, that we will not worry, be fearful, or but we are resting, giving our minds a rest, my God, casting our care so that our hearts can rest. Oh, we are giving every burden to God so that our spirit can rest. And we command a spirit of rejoicing, of jubilation and celebration to come over us now. Come on, y'all, and let's praise God. Come on and press in, press in, press in. Press in, press in, press in. Press in, press in. Come on and press in into God's presence this morning. We praise our Heavenly Father for being present with us today. We are grateful for a visitation of the Holy Spirit. We are grateful that His Spirit abides in each and every one of us. And as a result... As a result of that, the spirit is here even now. We thank you, oh God, that where two or three are gathered in your name, my God, there also is your presence. So we thank you, oh God, that your presence is going before us today. We thank you, oh God, that your presence is with us today. We thank you, Father, that the blood goes before us. We thank you, Father, that our prayers are covering much ground. In the name of Jesus, I wonder if I have anybody who will praise God this morning, who will command their soul to worship God this morning, who will command themselves to feel better, that where you are feeling heavy, you're telling the heaviness to go. Where you are feeling fearful, you're telling the fear to go. Where you are feeling anxious, you are telling the anxiety to go, and you're not just 
just telling these things to go in your own might or by your own spirit, but you are telling these things to go as it is commanded in the word of God, as it says in the word of God, I need somebody to hang on. I need you to have hope. I need you to put the full weight of your trust in your father. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, oh God, that you are going before us. Oh God, Rambabande, not just in this broadcast, my God, hey, not just in this day, oh God, Rebabande, not just in this week, oh God, not just for the rest of this month, oh God, not, hey, 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 not just for the rest of this year, oh God, Rebabande, hey, not just for the rest of this decade, oh God, but we thank you, Father, that you are going ahead of us all the days of our lives, that our prayers are covering much ground all the days of our lives. And we just say thank you, oh God. We just, hey, hey, hey. We just say thank you. We say thank you, oh God. Thank you this morning, Father. Oh God, we just say thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you and we praise you, oh God. Oh, Lord, we just worship you, Father. Oh, God, and we just commit this entire broadcast into your hands, oh, Lord. We commit everything into your hands that is needed in order for it to be successful, in order for this word to come through with power and with clarity. Hekandaya. Oh, rabababababande. Hey, some of you need to tell the enemy to shut up. Hey, kabande. Hey, and you don't have to be pretty or cute about it because the enemy ain't pretty or cute when he's coming after your destiny. He's not pretty or cute when he's coming after your mind. As a matter of fact, he's real savage when he's coming after your family. He's real savage when he's coming after your heart. He's real savage when he's coming after your finances. He's real savage when he's coming after your trust. Trust. He's real reckless when he's coming after your, your, your love for God. He's real reckless when he's coming after your belief. He's real reckless when he's coming after your encouragement. But some of you need to tell the enemy to shut up, sit down and be quiet, to stay where you belong, which is in the pit of hell to not come nigh unto me or anything connected to me. Oh God, we just say thank you. Oh God, Rabababande, hey, you have your way. Hikabandaya, you have your way, oh God. You have your way, oh God. Oh God, and we give this entire space over to you. In the name of Jesus, oh God, and we just ask that you make yourself known. Oh God, and that you allow this message to come forth with power and with clarity. We come against every disruption and distraction in the name of Jesus. We come against every hindrance and we command everything that is necessary for the word to come forth to operate the way that it is supposed to. We command the lights, the internet connectivity, the sound, the video, every part of it to operate the way that it is supposed to. So you be glorified. You be glorified, oh God. You be glorified, Father. And we just say thank you, oh God. And we pray these in all things in Jesus' name. My God, oh my God. Lord, we just thank you this morning. Um, but welcome to the broadcast. And this is our last week of our teaching series for the month of August entitled Discipline. Can y'all believe that August ends on Saturday? I mean, I just, I, I, I can't even. Like this month went by so fast, so fast, right? Um, so it ends uh, on Saturday, but this is the last day of our series entitled Discipline. And the overall series has focused on the spiritual practices that we do regularly, if not daily, to strengthen our faith and our trust in God. By the end of today's message, we will have learned about 12 disciplines or practices that can enhance our spiritual lives if we allow them to, okay? We've learned about the importance of study, prayer, and fasting, worship, fellowship, and celebration, 
confession, rest, and chastity, which is also known as purity. As a community, we've been practicing the discipline of rest as we are resting into God's miracles over the remaining days of August. So God has revealed new language to us. God has given strategies for these spiritual practices and has shown us the importance of community in helping us to live these practices or these disciplines out. I have literally been using the prayer that we learned last week to confess my sins, iniquities, and transgressions. After I learned that, I was like, I'm just covering all of my bases. I'm going to cover all the categories, and we just going to make sure everything, you know, is handled in the spirit realm. So this week, we are focusing on spiritual disciplines that are outward and service-oriented practices. As children of God, it is critical that what we think, say, and do reflects the character of our Father. We are called to help and to serve others in God's name, giving and sharing resources with others. We are all disciples and we have a responsibility to make disciples, teaching and guiding others in their faith journey. Now, this does not mean that we are all called to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, or part of the fivefold ministry. What it means is that we are to have a positive impact on those who are connected to us in our daily lives. We don't have to make it any more complicated or difficult than that. It means that everything everything Jesus teaches his disciples in the New Testament, it applies to us because we too are the disciples of Jesus Christ. What Paul and the other apostles in the New Testament teach is also being taught to us, but I'll cover more on that a little bit later. As a final reminder, it's important to note that there is no consensus list of spiritual disciplines among theologians, biblical scholars, or ministers of the gospel. More importantly, the Bible does not include a set list, a set list rather, so different people can list different disciplines, and some are more biblical than others. This month, we have been focusing on the life of Jesus and the codes or the practices or the disciplines that he lived by. We have been primarily focused in the New Testament and all of our scriptures today come from the New Testament. The reason why is because we want to know what Jesus teaches his disciples, which is us, about how to live a life that reflects our obedience to God, our trust in God, and helps to strengthen our faith in God. Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself, train yourself in godliness. For the training of the body has limited benefits, but the training of the spirit, which is godliness, is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And again, as a reminder, at the time that Paul wrote this, the Christians were experiencing a lot of what we are experiencing today. At that time, there were many fables, childish lesson, legends, and doctrines being spread about how to live a life that pleased God. And many of those doctrines were focused on enforcing rules about eating and drinking and other trivial sort of bodily exercises. So Paul was telling Timothy and us to focus on teaching the message, okay? Focus on teaching the good doctrine, which is the gospel message. That if we focus on teaching people to live in the way and by the principles that Jesus taught, God will always be glorified. If we focus less on what people are doing externally, although it does still matter, and more on what is happening internally, 
we will see that God is glorified and more people are healed, delivered, and set free. And as a reminder, even though the Bible does not have a bullet point list of spiritual disciplines that you are to practice, the spiritual disciplines that have been taught in this series are backed by scripture. These are the same things that Jesus did. If Jesus did it, why do you think you don't have to? OK, so don't try to get cute with it and find a way out and be like, oh, well, the Bible doesn't say, oh, but it does. It says it through how Jesus lived. It says it through how he treated others. It says it through the things that he did talk about and the things that he did teach to his disciples. OK, so we're not being cute with the word. We're not trying to find any outs. As a community, and especially in these times, we have got to be all in, and that includes being all in on the spiritual practices and disciplines that are modeled by the life of Jesus. So today, we are going to look at our last three spiritual disciplines, and these are the three spiritual disciplines that are more outward and service oriented, okay? So we've talked about the ones about personal relationship, inward and self-reflective and community-based things, but these are outward and service oriented practices that we see Jesus model and teach to his disciples. And then they use those things to build up the foundation for the modern church that we see today. All right, so let's get into it. If you're ready to get into the message, I want you to drop a heart in the comment box. I've got three quick things for you and then we're gonna be out of here, okay? All right, so this is number one for today, but it's number 10 of the entire set. So we have a set of 12, okay? 12 spiritual disciplines. That, are that were broken down over four weeks, okay? So this is spiritual discipline number 10 is to serve others. Spiritual discipline number 10 is to serve others. Serve others, okay? As Christians, we are called to live righteously which means that we live in right standing with God, not perfection, just right standing. So we are called to live righteously, especially in the face of suffering. The primary things that we are to arm ourselves with are the same attitude as Christ and God's will, okay? Past sinful behavior should no longer define us, and we should expect that people will be critical of us and sometimes even speak negatively about us because of what we believe. Even in spite of that, there should be mutual love, hospitality without grumbling or complaining about it. If you're going to complain and grumble about it, just don't do it because your heart is not right, okay? And there should also be the use of spiritual gifts to serve others. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Christians were living, or the Christians who were living in the Roman Empire experienced increasing persecution and social mistreatment. They were outcasts because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Those believers were encouraged to do all the things that we are still encouraged to do today, including serving others. Now, serving others is not just serving our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just serving where it is easy to serve. And that's where a lot of us fall short in our service because we think that as long as we are serving in the four walls of church, we're doing all that God has told us to do. That is incorrect, okay? We cannot just serve where it's comfortable and where our beliefs won't be challenged, but we've got to serve others in the entire earth. This is why as believers, we should not be afraid to travel, 
Every Christian should have a passport. Every Christian should be praying about where God wants to send them in the earth in order to do what God has called them to do. This is why for all of those of you who are still stuck in your hometown and you are afraid to go anywhere else, you got to take that fear to God. OK, even when we're traveling for vacation, it's an opportunity to evangelize and take the light of the Lord to places that may not have it. OK, so we've been called to serve the world and to reflect a different way of interacting with humans as Christians. So our first scripture for today is going to come from first Peter chapter four verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And one more time, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And the CSB translation says this, uh, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory and the power and the honor forever and ever. Amen. OK, so as Christians, we must recognize the urgency of taking care of the world around us. The end of all things is near and nobody knows the exact time. I'm not I don't have time to get into that, but nobody knows the exact time. OK, or the exact day. All right. We all going to be caught off guard, each and every one of us. OK. All right. So the end of all things is near. But we are just focused on recognizing that what that means for us as Christians is that we've got to live with intention and purpose. We've got to live with a sense of urgency focused on self-restraint, calmness, and thoughtful prayer. Above all, as Christians, we must maintain an intense love for one another. We must maintain intense love for one another because it, it is that godly love that covers a multitude of sins. This means that we are to be forgiving of one another and promoting unity, that we should quickly forgive and promote unity in abundance. So Christians, we have to be careful which means to be intentional about offering hospitality willingly, okay? No one should have to tell you to be generous or hospitable. We've got to be hospitable even when it is costly, Ooh. even when it is inconvenient. We've got to do it as a demonstration of love and service to other people. Each of us as a Christian has received a gift from God and that gift should be used to serve others. Now, a lot of times, you know, we try to substitute our serving for other spiritual disciplines. We try to say things or rationalize things like, oh, well, I don't, I don't go to church on Sundays because instead... I'm helping Miss So-and-so do something at her house. No, 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 no. This is not a substitution game. Again, we're not playing that cute little game with God thinking that you substitute one thing for the other, right? Now, if God tells you, you know, for example, this is an example that uh, uh, a member of our community has talked about openly so I can use it, but she had to miss um, her 
church's anniversary celebration to go serve her family in a time of need, right? Okay, cool, right? I mean, she, she goes to church every other Sunday. She don't miss a Sunday. So she's missing one Sunday in order to go to travel, to be present with her family. That is the ministry that she needs to be doing in that moment. And the same is true for all of us. But for those of us who think that every single Sunday we can substitute fellowship, which is a spiritual discipline that we learned about, for doing something else and calling it service unto God, God is like, ah, let's not get cute with it, okay? That our service, it is absolutely a demonstration of love and our gifts should be used to serve others, but it does not become a substitution for all of the other things that we are supposed to do. Church takes two hours once a week, okay? If you can't find time to help Miss So-and-so, the only time in your schedule that you can help Miss Robinson at her house is on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m.? Really? That, that's the only time out of the 150 plus hours of the week, those are the only two hours that you can help Miss Robinson. No, 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 okay? So we've got to find this beautiful balance between using our gifts, not just outside of the church, but also in the church, right? And this could also look like, I remember that there was a season for many years, and I'm so grateful um, for the leadership that I set under that gave me the grace for this. Uh, but there was a, a time where um, I couldn't come to church during the week, right? Um, I was at like the height of, or at the beginning of my seminary program, God had me traveling, doing a lot of ministry and speaking. So I was there on Sundays, but throughout the week, I, I couldn't always be there in person, right? Cool. Okay. So you find your balance and there's different seasons for different things, but you cannot spend a lifetime serving the world and then think that you're not going to serve the the in, in the four walls of the church because your gifts are needed there as well. My stance has always been that every gift you give to the world is the same gift that you should give to the kingdom. Let me say it again. Every gift that you give to the world is the same gift that you should give to the kingdom. I don't have time to expand on that right now because uh, we got to keep moving for the sake of time. But we are to act as good stewards of God's gifts and his grace that he gives us to exercise those gifts and to be a blessing to other people. When we are speaking and ministering, we should do so as if we are speaking the words of God. We should serve with the strength that God provides us. Literally this morning, no exaggeration, I was feeling weak. I was feeling hot and tired. I didn't know why, but I literally, uh, my husband picked me up in the spirit and he's like, are you okay? What's going on? How you feeling? I told him the man of God began to pray. I was praying and I was like, come on, Lord. Like I got something to do this morning. I got to have some energy and some strength. I got to, you know, deliver this word, right? So we're praying and we put on the worship music. We set the atmosphere, you know, we get the, the windows open, turn the lights on, get the air circulating all of those things matter to our psyche um so we, we're doing that all the things right and i told god i need strength energy and stamina that only you can give okay yes you have given me a gift but if you don't grace me to utilize this gift i'm going to faint every time and the same is true for all of us that without god's grace to use the gifts that we have, that we will always fall short of being able to glorify him through the use of those gifts, all right? So spiritual discipline number 10 is to serve others. Serve others. Spiritual discipline number 11. Spiritual discipline number 11, be generous toward others. 
be generous toward others. And yes, service and generosity are two different things. Be generous toward others. When we understand the overwhelming love that God has for us as his children, and when we recognize our identity as children of God, it should cause us to live in a manner that reflects our relationship with him. When we understand who we are and whose we are, we begin to live like it. We begin to look like, talk like, walk like, smell like, exist like our father, okay? Our right standing with God, which just means that we are on his side and not on the side of the world. We've chosen the right standing, okay? Our right standing with God and the evidence of the blessings we have received should cause us to live differently from the world. Our love for one another should be demonstrated through actions and not just words, okay? In 1 John chapter 3, which is the verse, uh, the chapter we're getting ready to go to, in 1 John chapter 3, the church faced threats from the world. They faced threats of false teaching, specifically of Gnosticism, which denied that Christ was both human and divine, that Christ was God in the flesh. Gnosticism also promoted this spiritual elitism, okay, where the folks thought that they were better than everyone else, but it literally contradicted the message of love and unity that Jesus preached, but these same people thought they were following the Lord. I don't understand how, right? So let's take a look at 1 John ch chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. All right. 1 John chapter, oh, I didn't make this bigger. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to make it big as I possibly can. Okay, here we go. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death or in darkness. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's how serious Jesus took this command to love others, okay? This is how we have come to know love. He, being Jesus, laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and truth. Let us love in action and in truth. So John was committed to sharing the gospel message, which is the same message that we should all be committed to. As Christians, we should recognize that love is one of the defining characteristics of our spiritual life. I never understood how Christians could say that they are Christians, but they are mean and nasty. Okay. Actually, you know what? I do understand it because a lot of people are dealing with bitterness. They're dealing with the spirit of anger, fear, resentment, all of these other things, right? I've shared my testimony before about overcoming the spirit of anger that I had dealt with, you know, in my earlier years of life, right? Just mad at the world about a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and I did before I had relationship with Christ. And even when I came into relationship, it took years to unlearn a lot of the defense mechanisms that I had built up from that place of anger and just having to be 
hardened in order to survive in the world and in the environment that I had been in prior, right? So I know where it comes from, but what I also know is it cannot stay, okay? Spirit of pride spirit of anger, resentment, bitterness, and frustration. It cannot stay when you have true relationship with Christ. Just as Christ exemplified love by laying down his life, we as Christians are called to love others sacrificially, even when we are facing hate from the world. Even when someone in the world is saying negative, nasty things about you, you are still called to turn the other cheek and respond in love, okay? Now, some people say, well, what do I do when I run out of cheeks? You never run out of cheeks. You always have two. And every time you just turn the other cheek, okay? So the ultimate model of love was Christ's willingness and his continued willingness to die for others, even his enemies, even the very people who nailed him to that cross, put that thorn, that crown of thorns in his head, nailed his feet, uh, beat and whipped him until his side burst open, that literally those people, Jesus loved them even until death. So as Christians, we must be willing to make personal sacrifices for the well-being of others that we must mirror Christ's selfless love for us. Genuine love, real love, goes beyond words and must be demonstrated through actions that resonate with the other person, okay? Because a lot of times we're doing the things, we, we call it, well, I'm giving or I'm doing or I'm serving, I'm loving, I'm being generous, but you're not doing it in the way that they need. You're showing up and supporting in the way that you want to versus the way that the person needs. If you're doing it the way that you want to, it's not truly sacrificial. Yes, you may have had to give up your time, give up a little bit of gas money, so forth and so on. But overwhelmingly, if you're not serving others in the way that they need to be served, then you're not doing it to the fullness that God wants us to. So genuine love, again, goes beyond words and must be demonstrated through actions. We have to show our love by helping others who are in need, not just by expressing good intentions, but we've got to actually follow through and do what we say that we are going to do. True Christian love has to be sincere. It must be truthful. It is not just a display of empty words, but loving others requires us to have intention and action, okay? Intention and action. That you can say that you love someone with your mouth, but if your actions and the things that you are doing behind their back is uh, not in alignment with what you say, you have an issue with your heart. OK, if you are saying I love you, I love you, but they don't feel love, then you've got to sit and dissect the reason why your actions don't feel like love. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, how many times you travel around the world or across your country to be present for them. If your actions, your true actions and the real posture of your heart is not one of love eventually it's going to creep out and they're going to discover it. And they're going to discover that what you say out of your mouth is not being backed up by your heart. Okay. And in today's world, we've got to be willing to rend our hearts, which means we violently tear them open in the place of prayer and confession so that God can deal with it. And what comes out looks like God and it feels like God's love. In a world that chooses to respond with hate, we are called to confront hostility with generous love that we are to be generous with our love, even to the point of being willing to sacrifice for those who oppose us. And when we do that, we live out the commandment to love, okay? 
that it, it, it it's not just oh love people you got to live this thing out it is central to our christian faith this is a commandment that is a non-negotiable for the christian and when you have a true relationship with Christ, where you've allowed your heart to be dealt with, where you've allowed your mindset and your perspective to be dealt with, it makes it very difficult for you to do anything less than demonstrating your obedience to God's will, which is to love his people. Because when you do anything less than loving his people, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you won't be able to do anything else except for what he says. So we must be generous. We must be generous with our time. We must be generous with our gifts and our talents. We must be generous with our tenth, which is our tithe, our money, okay? If you say that you are generous, but you're not a tither, just go ahead and stop saying it, okay? And let's, let's pray concerning your tithing, all right? Because tithing is an issue of the heart. Generosity, serving others, it's an issue of the heart. So you can give as much as you want to, and I don't have time today to do a lesson on the different types of giving, you can give to as many charities as you want to. You can give money to as many family members and friends as you want to. But if you're not tithing, right, which is giving a tenth of your income back to God, then you have an issue in your relationship with God. If it's easier for you to give to charities and to people than it is for you to give to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church to give to the kingdom of God or a ministry that you know is advancing the gospel, that's not an issue with you and the church. That's an issue between you and God, okay? So generosity, be generous. And then the last point, and we'll wrap up, this is spiritual discipline number 12. We're at the end, guys. Number 12 is to make disciples of others. Woo. Make disciples of others. Okay. Discipleship. Or what I like to call journeying with others. You guys have probably heard me say that a lot. It is one of my favorite things to do in life is to journey with the children of God, to journey with those particularly who either don't know God or are trying to find their way to a true relationship with Jesus. That that's my, that's my heart's jam. Like that makes my heart full. Okay. And when you are a disciple of Christ, journeying with other people should make your heart full. It means that you live by Christ's teachings and in the will of God. It does not mean that you are perfect. It means that you are striving to live a life that is set apart from that of the world. And as you are conquering various things in your life, you help others to do the same. In Matthew chapter 28, the entire, the entire chapter recounts or tells the story of the resurrection of Jesus and his final instructions to his disciples. In Matthew 28, we see that early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary found Jesus's tomb empty and are told by an angel that he is risen. So they are instructed to inform the disciples and on their way, they encounter the risen Jesus, reassures them and repeats the same message that he had been given before. Okay. God does not change his message. Okay. He doesn't change his message. He's not going to change his instruction either just because you don't want to do it. All right. So while all of that was going on and they were encountering Jesus, the guards who were responsible for guarding the tomb had to report the resurrection to the chief priests who then bribed them to spread a false story. 
So the chapter wraps up with Jesus meeting with his disciples in Galilee after his resurrection, where he gives them the great commission. Okay. And the great commission is to make disciples of all nations, baptize them and teach them to obey Jesus's command. They were to do this while reassuring all believers for all generations to come that Jesus's presence with them was continuous. So let's go to Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. Okay, the Great Commission. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In that authority, this was the instruction that he gave them. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus had been given all authority in heaven and on earth by God the Father. And because of that authority, he was then able to tell those disciples and to also communicate to us today as disciples the Great Commission. As Christians, we are called to spread the gospel globally. Again, if you're a Christian that don't have your passport, you already not doing the Great commission because you can't go nowhere. You, you can't go to the world if you don't have a passport. Okay. So we are called to spread the gospel globally, making disciples of all nations without discrimination. Okay. That means evangelizing to the person who is currently doing something that you don't agree with. Jesus also teaches us that baptism is essential for disciples, that when people get baptized, it is a public declaration of an inward confession. According to the Bible, you do not become a Christian when you get baptized, okay? You do not become a Christian when you get baptized. You become a Christian when you confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, okay? But you get baptized because you are a Christian, okay? So you don't become a Christian by getting baptized, but you get baptized because you are a Christian, okay? So baptism, Jesus taught, teaches us, is that this symbolizes our faith and commitment to Christ and allows our public community to hold us accountable. Discipleship involves us teaching other people to observe all that Jesus has commanded. If you are journeying with someone and you are not leading them back to the Bible, you are in dangerous territory to exalt yourself as a God in their lives. You are in dangerous territory of exalting yourself as an idol in their lives. It's not about Minister Tiffany. It's all about Jesus. This is why everything that I say and everything that I teach, I give scripture for. It, it's not my word. This, this ain't my commission or my command, right? You don't, don't take my word for it as a matter of fact. Take God's word for it. Go back and double check the scriptures and see if you get the same thing, right? We have Bible study and spiritual development courses in our group chat where we hash things out like this, where we ask questions and challenge one another and expand our perspective. Because this, this ain't the Tiffany show, okay? I'm gonna just, I'm gonna leave that one right there. So we've got to teach other people to do what Jesus said. And that when they do that, 
They lead a life of obedience that allows them to grow in faith. Jesus promises that when we disciple people, because it's not easy, okay? The folks are hard-headed. We, as the children of God, are hard-headed and we do not listen. We don't listen. We don't have to listen half the time, okay? So it can be hard, all right? If you know that you've ever been guilty of being a hard-headed child of God, you should have so much more grace and patience with people, the same level of grace and patience that God has with you. So what Jesus tells us is, I want you to spread the gospel message, baptize the people, and here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to be with you because you can't do this without me. If you try to go out into the world and disciple people without Jesus, the world going to eat you up, okay? When you encounter somebody of another religion and they preach you and teach you your Bible right up under the table, or they take which, uh, the, the Bible and twist it and contort it and do all of those things, right? Because you just letting the folks run rampant and just trample over you because you're trying to do it without Jesus. So it is Jesus who promises to always be with us and to provide guidance and support in this mission of journeying with other people until the end of time. Jesus says, I'm not going anywhere. I know so-and-so left. I know that pastor stopped preaching because they got tired. So-and-so stopped coming to church because they got burned out. But Jesus says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. I am with you. So we are asking God today to help us, to give us the grace to utilize our gifts to help the world, to give us the strength and the language and the covering to go into the earth and to spread this gospel message, to not get preached under a table by somebody who doesn't know our God. We are asking God to help us to serve others in his name, to give us the resources, okay? One of the things me and my husband always say to the Lord is, there's a specific command and calling that God spoke to us before we even started our courtship. We were still like friends slash boyfriend and girlfriend, and we fasted and prayed, and there were two specific things that God told us that we would do as a couple. That word has then been confirmed at least three different times, if not more, in public and in private, right? That this word has been confirmed over our lives. In order to do it, we need certain resources. So when we go to God talking about finances, when we go to God talking about the material things that we need, we take God back to his word. It, I, I, I can't do X, Y, and Z without A, B, and C. So I'm not asking for X, Y, and Z just because I want it. I'm asking because I need it to do what you said that I was called to do. So we ask God for these resources so that we can then share with others. Why do you have a 10 bedroom house and you got homeless family members? I'm confused. Now, unless you've given them time after time after time and they keep coming in, tearing up your home, disrespecting your house and the Lord then told you, okay, is enough is enough, then that's one thing. But you've got six, seven bedrooms in your house and your friend and her three children are sleeping in a homeless shelter. I'm confused. I I'm confused. Okay? That you got a car, but you don't never want to give nobody a ride home from church. I am confused. You got a car, but you can't never seem to take your car to church, but your car can carry you everywhere else. I'm confused. You have money, not rich, but you have money. You got $10, but you can't give $1 to advancing the gospel? Like not even just one, one of those $10, no? I'm confused. We've got to not just say that we are believers, but we've got to live this thing out. And as we live it out and we become better and better at living out this gospel message, we ask God to grace us to teach others and to guide them in their faith journey. Because how dare we, 
How dare we have access to something so good, so beautiful, and so wonderful, but we don't want to share it with others. It ain't even yours to hold on to. It's his gospel message. Okay? So I'm getting ready to close out in our final prayer. But before I do that, I want to invite you to do a couple of things. First and foremost, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want to make that confession today after hearing this message, I want you to type the word salvation in the chat box and uh, I will reach out to you after this broadcast, walk you through the prayer of salvation and then you're saved. A prayer of salvation and repentance. And that's it. That's it. It's, it's that simple. Okay. If you have been saved, you've been baptized, you've done all of the things, but for whatever reason, you feel far from God, or you know that you've not been living the way that God wants you to live, whatever that is for you, and you are ready to rededicate your life to God, I want you to type the word dedication. Dedication. Okay. And maybe you are someone who is watching today and you're like, listen, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, but whatever happened, whatever the reason is, I don't have a community. I'm not surrounded by a community of people who believe the same things that I believe. I want to welcome you and invite you to join the Mornings with God ministry. It is completely free to do so. All you've got to do is visit our website, click join the community, follow the prompts, and you're in. Okay, that's it. it it's really that simple. All right. And then last but not least, if this message has been a blessing to you, or this ministry has been a blessing to you, I invite you to partner with us as we continue to serve others as well. We currently have people watching from all around the world only because of generosity, okay? So if you believe in what we are doing and in this gospel message that we are spreading and the way in which we are doing it, I invite you to sow into the Mornings with God ministry. The information on how you can do so is in the chat box. And I'm really excited because starting in September, we will see some improvements, uh, even more improvements. We've just constantly been upgrading, okay? But we will see even more changes and improvements um, to the Mornings with God experience uh, starting in September. So I'm really excited about that, okay? So let us pray. Lord, we just come to you first and foremost to say thank you. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for this powerful word. We thank you, oh God, for just covering us and keeping us. We thank you for the exhortation that started off this broadcast that will carry us through the rest of this day and the rest of the week. We thank you, oh God, that we are in the middle of 15 days of miracles. And in the middle is where it can get hard. In the middle is where it can get challenging. But God, I pray and I ask that in the middle, you begin to prove that you are the God of the middle. We thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you, oh God, for teaching us how to serve others and showing us how you want us to help people. Thank you, God, for making us generous, making us generous givers, givers who are generous without even being asked just because we have a heart for generosity. And we use all of our resources to be a blessing to other people. And we thank you, oh God, that as we are discipled, we will reach back and pull another one forward. And we will always continue to reach back with patience and with grace to pull more people into your kingdom and to love them in such a way that they want to have a relationship with you. So God, we bless you for this broadcast. We bless you for this message and we bless you for this entire series and everything that you have done every single Monday through this series on being disciplined. 
We commit the rest of this week into your hands. We are looking for your miracles all week long, and we praise you, we worship you, and we say thank you. We pray these in all things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and unto you and you alone who is able to keep us from falling. We say thank you, God, 